This is the new Kia Nero EV, which is a fully electric, small hatchback, small crossover from Kia. There's already a Kia Nero EV, but this one has been fully redesigned for the 2023 model year. And today I'm going to review the new Kia Nero EV and show you all of its quirks and features. Before I get started, be sure to check out Cars and Bids, which is my enthusiast car auction website for cool cars from the modern era with free listings. You can list your cool car for free and auction it on Cars and Bids. And you should because we've had some great sales recently, including this Ferrari 360, which sold for $78,000, this wonderful Porsche 996 911, which sold for just under $42,000, and this Ford Bronco Raptor, which sold for over $107,000. We've done great with Broncos and Raptors on cars and bids. If you're looking to buy or sell a cool enthusiast car, check out Cars and Bids with free listings, daily auctions, and great selection at carsandbids.com. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features, the new Nero EV, with probably its largest quirk, at least from a styling perspective, and that would be this gray panel back here, which obviously is a different color from the rest of the car. Now, I'm not sure if you can change this to match the color of the car, but every press image of the new Nero shows this panel in gray. Blue cars have a gray panel, green cars have a gray panel, white ones do. The panel is always gray. Now, this is certainly strange. I personally kind of like it because I like the quirky and weird stuff, but I could see it being a turnoff for some people, and it's definitely distinctive on the outside of this car. Now, it's worth pointing out that aside from that unusual gray panel in back, the rest of the new Nero's design is actually pretty tame. Frankly, it looks a lot like the old Nero, which you can see here, just modernized, given sort of a more modern look with some sharper edges and creases, different lighting, different wheels, given a more modern take on the old Nero, essentially. Now, with that said, there are a couple of little items worth pointing out on the outside of this car, like, for example, rear lighting. You have the brake lights in what looks like a fairly normal place, as you can see, sort of next to the tailgate in back, but the turn signals are in the bumper. They don't share a lighting assembly with the brake lights, which is odd and unusual and a little quirky. Up front, you have kind of a strange grill design. Obviously, this is just for style, since electric cars don't need a grill, but you have sort of weird lines and hexagons and strange shapes, and that's your grill. Also, just like the old Nero, the new one has the charge port directly in the center up front, which frankly I kind of like, because when you pull into a charging station, it's off on the left or the right, you don't know which it's going to be, so it's nice to have it in the middle where you can always hook up, regardless of which side you pull in on. But if you want quirks, unquestionably, there are quite a few more quirks on the inside than on the outside, and probably the most unusual and controversial quirk is the center screen. Now, I don't mean the infotainment screen, which is fairly standard normal, and I'll get to that in a minute. Instead, I mean the center control screen, which you can see here, and it's controlling your climate controls, which is not all that unusual. A lot of cars use a screen for this purpose, not particularly strange, but the weird part is it has a dual purpose. If you press this button in the screen, suddenly it switches to now this very same screen is used to adjust your stereo and navigation system, but you can't do both at once. And this is especially crucial because that means the dial over on the left can be your radio volume, you can turn it up or down, or if you're on the other screen, it can be your interior climate control temperature, but it can't be both. So if you want to change your radio volume, but you're on the climate section of this screen, you got to press a button and then use the dial to change the volume, which adds another step to a process that should be really, really simple. Like I said, I suspect this is going to be pretty controversial, not exactly a great integration of these controls in my opinion, but it takes up less space in the interior, and it probably saves Kia some money by integrating all this into a screen rather than having different rows and rows of buttons. Now, interestingly, Kia isn't exactly allergic to using buttons and switches for some vehicle functions. And you know that because the center console is filled with buttons for various controls, including some controls that are less used than the ones incorporated into the screen directly above. The heated and cooled seats are here, they're buttons. The heated steering wheel is a button. The auto hold feature, which most people only press once every so 
often that's a button. All those things are buttons here in the center, even though some more common controls are integrated into that dual purpose screen directly above. Now, also in the center console here, you have this kind of weird gear selector situation. It's a dial and you twist it to go into drive to the right. You twist it the other direction to go into reverse. Neutral is in the middle and then park is a central button here. Different from a traditional gear selector, but that's what you have. Also weird in this interior, these little lines over on the passenger side of the dashboard. With the car off, you can see they're just lines, but with the car on, they actually light up. This is a trim piece that isn't just like a slab of wood. It's actually lit when the car is running to provide ambiance from the interior trim, which you don't see all that often. Now, as for the infotainment system, the screen in the center of this interior, it's fairly consistent with other Kia models, which means that generally speaking, I really like it. I love Kia infotainment. I love how intuitive it is, easy to use, responsive to your touch. It's really, really fantastic. My only complaint about Kia infotainment generally is the home screen, which you can see here. It's very like esoteric, doesn't really show you a lot of good information, and it's worse than pretty much everyone else's home screen. But of course, you can go to various other different screens and see all the information that other home screens show you, and so it works pretty much just as well. And I really like the fact that Kia lets you choose exactly what two displays you want to see at once. For instance, right now I'm just looking at the map, but if I tap this little icon on the side, another panel shows shows up to show me more information. And I can scroll in that panel through various different things if I want to see it simultaneously with the map. So it's cool to be able to see two things at once, and it's also cool to be able to configure that at will. Now, the other screen in this interior is the gauge cluster screen mounted directly behind the steering wheel, of course. And this screen is fine, although frankly, I just wish it did more. I wish it was more configurable, could show you a full screen map or various other things, but it's just not all that configurable, can't really do all that much, can show you some different displays, but not as much as you might expect from a screen. The whole point of having a screen there is to show you all sorts of stuff however you want it, but here it pretty much just shows the gauges that it replaced. Now, with that said, I do love the fact that this screen shows you your headlights and wiper position when you go to adjust them. So many cars, you turn on the wipers and you're not sure if it's like on or intermittent or auto. In this car, when you turn them on, it actually pops up on the screen showing you exactly what you've just selected, which is easier and safer because you're not looking at the stock trying to figure out what you've chosen. Same deal with the headlights. You turn them on and it shows you exactly what you've chosen, what position they're in right now as sort of a redundancy to the stock. Yes, you can also look on the stock if you want to see it there, but looking in the gauge cluster directly in front of you makes it easier. And I love that Kia models do that. One other thing this gauge cluster can do is change its appearance when you change the drive mode. To do that, you have a little button hanging off the bottom of the steering wheel that says drive mode. You push that to go into normal eco or sport. And as you can see, the gauge cluster changes what it's showing you as you go through those different drive modes to give you sort of a slightly different experience. By the way, also mounted on the steering wheel in terms of controls over on the left side, you have the controls for the driver assist technology. And I must say, this car driver assists very well. On the freeway, it'll steer for you, brake, accelerate, and it does it all fantastically. It goes around highway curves. It's really, really a good driver assist system, which is nice to see in a vehicle like this. Those are common and high-end luxury cars, but it's starting to trickle down into more affordable cars, good driver assist technology with a capacitive touch steering wheel. Just let your hand rest on the wheel and the car does a lot of the rest of the work on the freeway. It's nice to see. By the way, one other quirky control in here, the cup holders in the center console, fairly large, but you can see they're not like full circles. So are you worried your drink might roll around or splash? Well, you can push this little button that says push and then boom, suddenly a full circle has appeared to keep your cup in place if you have a smaller one, which is kind of a fun thing just to push at stoplights, frankly. And next up, we move around to the back seat in the Nero, where you get in and quickly discover that it's, well, actually, it's pretty tight back here. Not really all that surprising considering what this vehicle is, small crossover, small hatchback, but it is relatively tight. Adults can ride back here, even taller ones, but their knees are going to be pushing against the front seat, head pushing against the roof, not a huge back seat. With that said, there are some nice amenities back here. You have rear climate vents, which is nice to see in a car 
car like this, you don't often get that, but you do here. You don't have rear climate controls, but that's okay. The vents are pretty nice. You also have rear heated seats, at least in this version, which is a nice luxury to have. And you have rear mounted USB-C charge ports in the backs of the front seats. You can see both sides have charge ports so rear passengers can charge their devices. So not a lot of space back here, but some nice amenities, especially for the class. And next up, we move around to the back of the new Nero. But before I get into the cargo area, one interesting item back here, those gray panels I mentioned earlier seem to serve some sort of aerodynamic purpose. If you look closely, you can see they don't quite line up to the rear doors. They're actually jutted out a little bit. And if you look even closer, you can see there are holes behind the panel for air to pass through. And those holes come out behind the brake light. It looks like air actually can channel under this gray panel and come out the back of the car. Now, I'm not sure if this actually has any benefit or real practical purpose, but you do have a little arrow hole on the side of your Kia Nero like you might see in a McLaren. Anyway, getting into the cargo area back here, the new Kia Nero it has a little power tailgate. And when you're back here, you can see fine, reasonable cargo space for a vehicle like this. Not exactly huge, but totally what you'd expect and practical enough for this size. Now you do have access to more storage if you want it by lifting up the floor. You can reach down here, lift it up, and you can see extra storage under the floor so you can stick more stuff down there. But if you want even more storage, you can find it up front. Open up the front hood, and since this is an electric vehicle, you don't have an engine under here. Instead, you have this black plastic box, as you can see. Lift that open and there's extra storage. Now, it's not a huge storage compartment. You don't have a ton of extra space up here, which you might think you would considering no engine, but you don't. But there is still some storage, which adds some practicality. The only drawback is accessing this spot. Some cars, you press a little button and the front trunk comes open and there's your storage. Here, it's a latch on the driver's foot well, like opening up a hood, and then coming up here, a second latch under the hood to open it up, and then you get in, which limits the practicality of your newfound front storage. But anyway, since I'm up front where the engine usually is, let's talk performance. The new Nero EV has 201 horsepower. Not a huge figure, and in fact, exactly the same as the old Nero EV, but the new one does have some extra range. The EPA says 253 miles of range in the new Nero EV compared to 239 in the old one. So same power, but a little bit more range. This one also has DC fast charging capabilities. So if you find the right charger, you can charge this from 10% to 80% in just 45 minutes, Kia says, which is relatively quick for an almost full charge. And by the way, if you're not looking for a full electric vehicle, the Kia Niro is still offered as a regular hybrid and as a plug-in hybrid, just like the outgoing model. So regular hybrid, you put gas in it, drive it like a normal car, no plugging in at all, or a plug-in hybrid sort of in between. You can drive on fully electric power, but there's a gas engine for backup as well. So you can still choose between three different flavors of Niro, although the EV has the most power and performance. As for pricing, Kia has not yet announced pricing for the new Niro EV but they expect it to come in around $40,000 to start, maybe $40,000, $41,000 for like a base model. And this more premium version is likely going to be around $45,000, which is interesting because that competes directly with the Kia EV6, which is Kia's other new electric crossover. Now, a Nero EV has more range than a base model EV6. Like I said, 253 miles in the Nero EV versus 232 miles in a base model EV6. And the Nero EV also has has more power, but the EV6 definitely looks cooler, more striking, more exciting, more fun. It's more engaging to drive and it's larger. EV6 has more interior space, more cargo room, and so it might be more desirable than the Nero EV for a lot of people. But in terms of pricing, Nero EV and base model EV6 actually line up pretty closely. Now, one interesting thing is a Tesla comparison. A base model Model 3 starts around $47,000 with 267 miles of range. Range. This probably going to start around $40,000, $41,000 with 253 miles of range. So the range number is pretty close. This would probably be six or seven thousand dollars cheaper than a Model 3, and it has great driver assist technology. It's kind of an appealing comparison to an entry level Model 3. And by the way, one other item worth noting about the Nero EV is that you can make it move just standing outside of it using only the key. Okay, check this out. This is the key, which by the way, I 
really like because the lock button is mounted on the side sort of at an angle and it seems like you're detonating something when you lock it. It just makes you feel cool and powerful. But also on the key, you have these two little buttons marked P with an arrow pointing up and down. Those buttons will actually let you move the car forward or backward from the outside. You can see right now I'm standing here holding down that button. The car is moving on its own. I'm outside of it and it's moving forward and you can do the same thing moving backwards. You press the P with an arrow backwards and then you can get the car to move backwards when you're outside. And you may be wondering uh, why would anyone ever want to do this? The thinking is if you're parked in a really tight spot like in a building parking garage or someone came in next to you and you can't even get inside you can use the key to move the car out of the parking space to make it easier to access. I, I don't think this is really all that practical but it's possible and it's certainly quirky. All right driving the Nero EV. <laughs> 201 horsepower. It doesn't seem like a lot, but actually this is pretty quick. I step on it, it feels fast. I'm not sure what they're quoting the 0-60 to 60 yet, but this feels surprisingly fast, almost hot hatchbacky like which is kind of interesting. Now, on that subject, I want to talk about what exactly this is. Kia calls it a crossover, and the reason they do that is because people are buying crossovers right now. But if you actually look at the dimensions of this vehicle, it's a hatchback. And that's especially true when you consider it's not offered with all-wheel drives. Front-wheel drive only, to me, this is very, very, very clearly a hatchback. But crossover hatchback, whatever, it's the Kia Nero. And frankly, it's relatively popular in its current form. So let's talk through the driving experience. Um, interior is pretty good for a vehicle at this price point, size point. Uh, it's, you know, for a compact hatchback or a compact crossover, it feels relatively nice in here. You get good technology, you get good equipment, heated steering wheel, like I showed you, that little feature that'll move the car forward or backward, um, rear climate vents. There's some nice stuff in here you don't always see at this price point. Rear heated seats, good infotainment, a lot of nice stuff. But with that said, it does drive a lot like a compact hatchback. Uh, no surprise because it is one. But what that means is you do get tire noise, you do get wind noise. It's not like an ultra luxury car where you're uh, immune from every noise on the outside. It drives like, you know, a RAV4 or a Volkswagen Golf or vehicles like that in terms of like ride comfort and noise on the outside and things of that nature. In fact, there's a little bit more tire noise than I was expecting. Steering and handling also kind of as expected, similar to vehicles like this. It's not particularly, uh, uh, engaging or exciting. You don't exactly toss it around and get a lot of feedback. The steering is pretty numb. Um, it's more responsive than I was expecting. More and more cars are, are getting better and better steering response. And coupled that with the acceleration, it actually drives like a better performance car than I thought that it would. Um, but it still isn't what I would consider to be like fun or particularly engaging or enjoyable. What this car really is, to be honest, is an electric car for people who don't want to get something that's like weird or different or bizarre, and they don't want to spend a zillion dollars. They don't, you know, it's not like a Tesla person or someone buying a Porsche Taycan. They don't want to make it part of their identity. They just want a car that goes point A to point B, and it's electric. And this is actually really great at that. It's a pretty good dollar per range um, value proposition. If it's in the low $40,000 range with 253 miles of range, that's pretty good. And frankly, I think it's a totally reasonable driving experience. It's exactly what you'd expect. Again, not in incredibly engaging or exciting, but it drives well. It's fine. It's, it's useful. It's practical. Overall, I would say that th this is a good car. It's not earth shattering. It's not amazing, but it's good. It, it does everything that people buying a vehicle like this would expect a vehicle like this to do. It drives well. It's nice. Um, and the driver assist tech is good and the overall tech in here is good and I think this is a pretty compelling package at the price point. Now personally I really like the EV6 which is Kia's other electric vehicle um, that sort of it takes over where this leaves off. It's a little bit bigger, a little bit more expensive, more performance and if I could stretch to get one of those I would but if you're not looking for performance or style you just want a point A to point B electric car this is that and frankly I think it does quite a good job at being that. And so that's the new 2023 Kia Nero EV. This is a nice little electric car, but it faces a lot of competition from a litany of new electric cars, including Kia's own EV6. But this certainly holds its own, and it's definitely interesting and quirky. And now it's time to give the new Nero EV a Doug score.
And the Doug score is here, 46 out of 100, which puts the Neuro EV here against some other relevant cars. It beats out all its relevant competitors I've tested, the Chevy Bolt EV and EUV, the prior Kia Nero EV, the BMW i3, though it can't quite beat the Volkswagen ID4 or Tesla Model 3. That's okay because both of those cars are a lot more expensive, so if you're looking for an electric car with a reasonable price, this is a great option with some impressive technology.